pretext tasks. Actually, both this unit and the last unit of this lecture cover pretext tasks, but the last category of pretext tasks that we discovered, the so called contrastive tasks, have developed into their own field. That's why I separated these two units. But both are effectively pretext tasks. What is a pretext task? So far, um, we have looked at self supervised models which were tailored towards a specific downstream task, such as monocular depth estimation, or optical flow, or scene flow estimation. Now, in this unit, our goal is to learn more general neural representations using self supervision. Towards this goal, we're going to define a so called auxiliary task, a pretext task, such as predict the rotation of an image, a random rotation of an image. The image has been randomly rotated, like the image of this bird, and we want to uncover what is the canonical orientation of that image. And we're going to use this auxiliary, this pretext task, as an auxiliary task for pre training in the hope that this learns good this leads us to good features that we can then reuse for the downstream task of interest so we define an auxiliary task such, a, such as rotation prediction for pre-training and for this of course we have lots of unlabeled data we can just download millions billions of images from the internet and then we can rotate them and ask the network what was the rotation that i did and I can rotate, rotate them arbitrarily in arbitrary step sizes. For example, I can take any of the 90 degree possible rotations and ask the network by how much has this Im image been rotated. <clears throat> so this is the pretext task. We take a lot of unlabeled data. We define such a convolutional neural network on a pretext task where we have a few convolutional layers and some fully connected layers. And in this case, we want to classify either of four possible orientations. In this case, 90 degree would be the correct answer. Um, and then we throw away these last layers here in white and just keep the convolution, the weights of the convolutional layers, the so-called feature extractor, and copy that for the downstream task. Let's assume the downstream task is, is not rotation prediction, but is classification. We want to classify that there's a bird in this image. And then we have a small amount of labeled data, maybe 20 instances, where we have images with birds and other objects. And we uh, have the labels for these 20 birds and 20 dogs and 20 cats. But because there's only 20 images per category, of all, there's a very small data set, we cannot afford to update all the parameters of the network. But we hope that these parameters that we have learned in the pretext task are already good. They are general, they are semantic in some sense, such that it's sufficient to just add one or two more layers and just train these layers, for example, just one layer, a linear classifier, and obtain good performance from this model by having transferred the, the, the large chunk of parameters from the pretext task and just adding a little small readout head to that network that has to be trained and it can be trained with, with less data. And then we evaluate this network on the target task, which is classification. Now, what is pretext? What is a pretext task um, in general? So I copied this from Wikipedia. A pretext, uh, pretextual task is an excuse to do something or say something that is not accurate. Pretexts may be based on a half truth or developed in the context of a misleading fabrication. Pretexts have been used to conceal the true purpose or rationale behind actions and words. Now, clearly, this is not what we want to do. We want to find a pretext task that is somewhat related to the downstream task. Yet, it is a pretext. It is a replacement for what we want to actually do. And we do this because it's easier, right? As in this example, it's easier to tell my wife 
I'm going to the library every evening rather than telling the true story. Okay. So um, here's another, like, like now in the following slides, we're going to look at a couple of these, like, of these pretext tasks that have been proposed in the literature. And admittedly, they are all quite, you know, hand engineered. There is no theory, at least not yet, underlying this pretext task. There's just empirical evidence for each of these pretext tasks that they empirically work well. That empirically, when we copy the weights and apply them to some downstream task where we just fine tune some layers or maybe a few iterations of all layers, that we can get away with less label data for the downstream task. Okay, so here's another pretext task. This is called uh, learning by context prediction. It's one of the first one from Dersh et al. in ICCV 2015. In this task, the goal is um, from two patches to predict the relative location. So we're taking a center patch here in blue, and then we're asking for this patch here, we are, we're just observing these two patches, and we're asking the network to classify if the red patch was at this location, or this location, or this location, etc. There's eight possibilities, so it's an eight-way classification task. Given this blue patch and the red patch, there's eight possible locations how the red patch could be locate, located with respect to the blue patch. So the goal of context prediction is to predict relative position of patches. Relative position of patches. It's a discrete set. And the hope again here is that this task requires the model to learn to recognize objects and their parts. The task is designed in a way that if the model wouldn't learn about learn something interesting about how objects are composed, um, it wouldn't be able to solve that task. To understand this a little bit more, let's play a little game. This is actually the game that has been uh, in the teaser figure of that paper. You'll find it if you look up the paper. Can you identify where the red patch is located relative to the blue one? So I give you five seconds to do this thought experiment. Probably, if you look at these two patches, probably what you will say is, well, this is the front of a bus and this is the, the left back of a bus. So it's likely that this patch is at the bottom right of this patch. <coughs> It's unlikely that it's at the bottom <coughs> because it would have to show the front of the bus. It's unlikely they would be to the left because it would have to show some background. Similarly here, this patch is more likely to be on top of this patch because it shows the top of the train and this shows the bottom of the train. If a model, a neural network, wants to do the same task correctly, you can already see there has to gain some knowledge about objects in the world. And that's what we're leveraging here. This is the architecture that was used. There's these two patches coming in. <clears throat> There's a Siamese kind of architecture here with convolutions and pooling until we have a fully connected layer. And then the output of this fully connected layer is, is concatenated. And then there is a, a small number of fully connected layers in order to make a classification. This sounds all great, but there has some care has to be taken. In particular, we have to take care that the neural network doesn't take any trivial shortcut solutions. And that's really what's happening in practice. Neural networks don't do what you want them to do. They do what's easiest. For example, if we take patches that are directly adjacent to each other, the neural network can, instead of understanding the object in terms of its semantics, just look at edges and try to align the edges. If it sees that edges are aligned, then it's likely that this patch, uh, this patch configuration here is more likely than this patch configuration, like left and right are swapped, right? 
because of this con continuation of this edge. So we need to distract the model from looking at this, from exploiting these trivial shortcuts. And the way this has been done in this work is to include a small gap between the patches to not make them directly adjacent to each other, so such that edge continuity can be exploited, and also to jitter the patch location slightly, spatially, to also avoid this phenomenon. There is a more subtle shortcut. And I can clearly remember when I was at ICCB 2015, I was in Chile, um, I was standing in the back of, of a, the big lecture hall where this paper was presented. And I was, I was just immediately catching my attention because I was just, I wasn't believing it in the first place. So they found out there is another shortcut. It was quite, quite tricky to actually understand where it comes from. In order to understand where it comes from, the shortcut that the network was exploiting in order to overcome having to actually learn more semantic meaningful representation was that the network had actually an easy time to predicting the absolute image location. And if, if a network from just observing a patch is able to predict the absolute image location, then the relative location of patches can be easily inferred, obviously. So why is this happening? The authors ask. And they did a little experiment to understand this, or to first verify that this is actually happening. So they took images and cropped patches at random locations, and then trained a neural network to predict um, in a supervised fashion, the absolute image location of each patch, given just the patch and no other information. The network had to predict that this patch here, if it sees that patch, that patch appears in the top right. And here on the right, you can see the result. And you can see that it's actually working. The network that's just observing this patch is able to predict the absolute image location. How is that possible? Where is this image location encoded in this local patch? How can the network learn that this part of the image is, should actually be on the right of the image? Or this patch here should actually be on the left? Here's the solution. <laughs> the solution is that some cameras, some camera lenses shift color channels differently depending on the image location. In particular, bad cameras with bad lenses suffer from a so-called aberration problem. And we have discussed aberration already in the image formation lecture. Aberration comes from the lens refracting light of different wavelength differently. And that means that there's a color shift of the different color channels, a spatial shift of the different color channels. And that spatial shift is dependent on the location in the image. And the model can exploit that fact. It can just look at the local, it can learn the local color shift without ignoring everything else, ignoring texture, ignoring semantics, ignoring what's happening in the patch, just trying to figure out the color shift in order to predict the location. And that's what was happening. The solution to avoid this trivial uh, tutorial shortcut for the network was to randomly drop color channels or projection, uh, project the colors towards a gray channel or just use a gray image, uh, which of course doesn't admit to this shortcut. Okay, so now having solved these trivial shortcuts, um, the network was actually able to learn something semantically meaningful that can be transferred to downstream tasks. And so they tried this for object detection, for example. This is an RCNN that we have discussed already. And what they did is we trained these convolutional neural network features using this pre-training technique, using context prediction without any labels. <coughs> and then they used a small uh, uh, then they used a um, uh, 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 smaller um, set, a training set for training the uh, remaining parameters and, and fine-tuning the remaining parameters of uh, the neural network. And what they found is that 
if you don't use any pre-training, you obtain significantly worse results compared to um, the results that they obtained using context prediction for self-supervision for pre-training. And while the performance is not yet on par in this case with pre-training using ImageNet labels, also because this is a very semantic and, and a very, you know, it's a recognition task. So it, it benefits really from this, from these supervised semantic categories. It's quite impressive that the performance is, is, uh, is already rivaling the performance of fully supervised ImageNet, huge amounts of data pre-training without any labels. And it also works for surface normal est estimation. So here are results for surface normal estimation, uh, which is a completely different task. But again, they observe that without pre-training, the results are significantly worse and they sometimes even outperform the uh, ImageNet uh, pre-trained models. And in this case, it also makes more sense. Surface normal estimation is a task that's very different from recognition. Therefore, um, it's harder for a recognition um, data set to pre-train uh, the parameters of this model well. And so it's easier to compete with these supervised methods here. What they also did in the paper is they looked at what the network, what the visual representations actually are, what the network has learned. And one way to do that is, we've discussed this already in the deep learning lecture, is to just find nearest neighbors. So for these particular queries here, they tried to find the nearest neighbors in the feature space. And they compared random initialized network, AlexNet, and their self-supervised method. And they found that in many cases, random initialization doesn't give you meaningful results, but their retrievals are actually semantically meaningful in a way that also the patches retrieved using ImageNet pre-training are. As you can see here, for instance, for this um, water body image, there's, there's a lot of water images retrieved. For horse legs, there's a lot of horse legs retrieved. For this cat, there's a lot of cats retrieved, and so on. This is another pretext task. It's called jigsaw puzzle. In a jigsaw puzzle, the idea is to, in a jigsaw puzzle pretext task, the idea is to just randomly permute a uh, free by free tiled version of the image and ask a network to recover, like in a jigsaw puzzle, recover the original image. Now, because there's nine factorial different permutations, which is very large, this is a too large classification problem. So they restricted themselves to 1000 possible random permutations that they have predefined. And these permutations have been chosen based on the Hamming distance to increase the level of difficulty. So they try to find particularly hard permutations um, to make the model learn better. This is the architecture. There's these uh, nine patches that are fed in uh, permuted first and then fed into this uh, convolutional architecture. And then the features are um, fed into this uh, MLP for uh, 1000 way classification. And that's then used for backpropagating and, and training these models. Also, in the case of jigsaw puzzles, they had to make sure to print shortcuts. And the story is similar to the story from the previous paper. Also, the methods have been developed at similar times. Um, the shortcuts happen because um, they are useful, or the shortcuts are important for the model because they are useful for solving the pretext task, but they are not relevant to the target task. That's why we want to avoid them. One shortcut is low-level statistics. If you look at adjacent patches, they often include similar low-level statistics like the mean and the variance. And the solution that they applied to this problem, to solve this problem, is to normalize the patches based on their mean and variance. Then also edge continuity. We talked already about this. Um, and so they 
uh, also selected uh, 64 by 64 pixel tiles randomly from larger cells, effectively also applying some jittering and uh, padding. And then the same is uh, here also true for chromatic aberration. Um, and they uh, basically applied grayscale images or applied a spatial jitter to each color channel by a few pixels to avoid this. Shortcuts is in a general an interesting problem for learning deep neural networks. And if you are interested more in shortcut learning, I can highly recommend this paper here from Matthias Betke's group in Tübingen called Shortcut Learning in Deep Neural Networks. Here are the representations that are learned by solving jigsaw puzzles. You can see they are meaningful. There is this low level um, statistics learned in the um, earlier layers of the network. And then as you go to more to later layers, you get more semantic, uh, the meaningful activations. So these are the patches that activate a particular neuron. Um, so here also they applied this representation to Pascal VOC, classification, detection, segmentation. This is uh, one of the famous challenges from a few years ago. And what they found is that their performance in some cases, for instance, in uh, the case of object detection was already rivaling the performance, despite now this being a recognition task of ImageNet fully supervised pre-trained models using the same architecture, um, same pre-training time, but just without labels. So here, this first row is pre-trained on ImageNet, fine-tuned on Pascal VOC. This was the standard par paradigm up to then. But they have shown that actually you don't need this ImageNet data set. You can also pre-train using such pretext tasks and you obtain in some cases, at least, comparable performance. This is another pretext task. It's called image in painting. It's a little bit related to the um, denoising autoencoder that we have already seen. But in contrast to the denoising autoencoder, it requires more semantic knowledge because here now, not individual pixels, but entire large regions are masked out. And the key, uh, the, the task now is to try to recover this region that has been removed and to recover that from the context alone. You can see that the model actually can do a, 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 a decent job in, 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 the, in doing that. Uh, state of the art methods today, five, six years later are much better than this, but already in 2016, where things like semantic segmentation and image level reasoning with neural networks was quite new, um, results like this could be achieved. And then this, in order for the model to to actually perform this well, it has to learn something about how the world is structured. It's always the same idea. This is the image rotation prediction task we've already seen in the teaser. The goal is to predict in which orientation the displayed image has uh, is shown. Or the images are artificially rotated and the output is a four-way classification. We try to recover the true orientation. And again, in order to recover the correct orientation, the premise is that semantic knowledge is required for solving that task. To summarize the pretext task unit, pretext tasks focus on visual common sense. For example, rearrangement, prediction of rotations, in painting, colorization, etc. The models are forced to learn good features about natural images, for example, uh, semantic segmentation of an object category in order to solve the pretext tasks. So they have to implicitly solve this harder task in order to solve the pretext tasks. That is how the pretext tasks have been chosen. We don't care about pretext task performance, but rather about the utility of the learned feature representations for the downstream tasks that we actually care about. And these tasks that we actually care about could be image classification, object detection, semantic segmentation, depth estimation, normal prediction, etc. Now the problem with this is that designing good pretext tasks is tedious and still some kind of black art. 
And there's no good theory around this. So it's not clear how to construct better pretext tasks. And another problem is that the learned representations may not be general. It's not clear how the pretext task actually relates to the downstream task. And that's what we're going to look at next.